And um, my name's Jody Mayhew, and I'm teaching Rebuilding the Church of the Heart. And I want to pray as we begin. Father, thank you for this opportunity to be together today in this way. I am praying for your word to accomplish your will during this time together. I pray for your anointing upon what I share and an ability for your spirit to accomplish what you want to do in each heart now. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I get to share today about something that's really um, close to my heart, something that um, has been kind of worked into my heart over the last 30 years. And just to begin with, I think there's one word that we've heard in an overused way over the last 10 to 11 months. And it's uh, the word that's been used to describe our last year is unprecedented. Do you ever hear the word used that much as we've heard it this year? It means never done before or known before. So in a way we've misused the word because our, our country's gone through pandemics, our country's gone through great times of division and conflict. It's been unprecedented for this generation, the kinds of things that we're facing. So that's where unprecedented comes into play. And during this last, oh, let's say 10 months, life really became limited. We, we became limited to just the essentials. And that word means absol absolutely necessary or extremely important. So you heard uh, descriptions of essential workers or essential purchases. And then essential gatherings and the debate kind of came around is the church an essential gathering so many of us probably all of us long to return to normal we we wish things could be somehow the way they were but what if what if this season can be about reteaching us reteaching us um, what the essentials are for the church, and it could be a time of rebuilding a church of the heart. Now, I'm going to kind of get more into describing what that is, but I really believe that kingdom extension, church planting, can be accomplished in this hour in different ways if we begin to learn uh, to look what were the essentials when it came to church and ministry and mission in the scriptures? And how can we participate in that during a season when it seems like all doors have closed? So prayer, prayer is the key for having our imagination, having our direction changed and hearing what that new direction could be. But it's more about listening and responding in prayer than it is about lamenting or uh, making requests and hoping God responds to us. What if this is the hour where we are in a place of responding to God and could hear what he has in mind if we would respond to him? So I want to share with you uh, some lessons from uh, that I've learned from the prayer summits. And for those of you that don't know what a prayer summit is, I became involved with uh, Multnomah School of the Bible uh, and Dr. Joe Aldridge back in 1990. And he, he had gone to Salem, Oregon. He had gathered a group of pastors together at that time and had asked them, the, the pastors, to consider what would it take to see a move of God initiated and sustained in a given region? And he proposed that the leaders of, of Salem would go away for four days just to seek the Lord, listen to him, and hear what he had to say to their community. He didn't have an agenda. He didn't have a plan. They went away, and for four days, Jesus got to be the leader of the church. And so 
what happened at that first summit was so dramatic and so powerful that each one of those pastors went home, they told their friends, they told their congregation, they told their fellow pastors in their denomination, and requests for prayer summits began to happen across the, our state, um, then across the Northwest, and then eventually across the world. I became involved with the prayer summits um, at the very first women's prayer summit back in 1990. And because this wasn't um, a pre-scripted thing that we were doing, this was gathering the church from a local area and having them go away together to meet with the Lord. We didn't, there wasn't like a training you could take a way that you could prepare for this. So we began to come together as facilitators once a year and respond to one another and say, what are you seeing? What's happening? And so I became a facilitator in 1990. I began to attend these um, uh, prayer summit gatherings and we began to look and see that the Lord had a pattern when the church met together um, you know, a lot, of, we have a lot of different stories, a lot of different testimonies, but there was a similar pattern that began to show up in each one of the prayer summits. And we call that our hand illustration. And as I talk about this, I want you to kind of keep in mind that my title was Rebuilding a Church of the Heart. And prayer summits began to build a church of the heart at the level of the city. We're going to take that to smaller, uh, um, uh, smaller examples when we, we apply it to smaller groups. But these prayer summits began to rebuild a church of the heart at the level of the city. And so when we would come together, there I'm going to give you um, uh, this pattern that we learned. And I'm going to use my hand to illustrate it across the board. Every single one of them where we met with the Lord, we began by focusing on worship. This was the most, this was the singular most important aspect of our gathering together. That from the get go, we would orient ourselves towards the Lord, repenting from distractions and focusing on the one person who had the, that who was to be the source of our attraction. So as we would begin to worship him, as we would begin to lift up his name through song, through, through scripture, through uh, people leading out in prayer, as we came into a heart alignment with the Lord, the whole group gathered. And some of these groups, boy, they were as big as 350 people when we facilitated one down in California, and they've been as small as eight. But when you get this group that begins to focus in and worship the Lord, God's presence is being lifted up. He is being honored in the midst. And we have basically what it amounted to an Isaiah 6 moment that we would experience at these prayer summits too. We would see the Lord high and lifted up. And when we did that corporately, the next part began to take place and there would be an expression of humility within the group. Now, sometimes we can start out our prayer time and posture ourselves and say, I humble myself before you. But when we see him for who he is, he humbles us before him. And there becomes a point in time where we have been brought to this place corporately of humility. Now that shows up often with confession. It may show up with an emotion. Uh, people begin to weep in his presence. It may show up with one person who stands in God's presence and begins to recognize, woe is me, here I am. I'm unclean. I can't stand in your presence without confessing. And so confession would come forth. And when just one person would confess, there would be a breakthrough for the whole group to enter into a place of humility before the Lord together. Now, humility 
is really, you know, sometimes we think it's having like this low view of ourselves, but humility is a declaration of dependence. Jesus humbled himself. It wasn't that he was less than, but he, for the period of time that he walked among us, he said, I only say what I hear the father saying. I only do what I see the father doing. I don't act on my own initiative. And so he humbled himself. He made a declaration of dependence upon the father. And when we go from worship to this place of humility, the church gathered begins to make this confession of dependence upon the Lord. Now, those two actions, those two places of positioning ourselves before Jesus, sometimes it can happen as quickly as an hour, you know, in the first hour that we gather together, that can take place. And there have been times as a group, it would take us to the end of the fourth day before we would hit this place of humility and there would be a breakthrough. Facilitators were there to keep people focused so that we could hit this point of breakthrough because what happens at that point uh, determines the rest of what's going to happen. So holiness, worship, of the Lord, that's the first, brings us to the point of humility, that's the second, which brings a whole group into unity with the Father, a whole group into unity with the Father. I did a prayer summit back east, and um, my husband and I facilitated that summit together, and it was, all I can describe is it was stuck we could not come to a place of breakthrough. And um, we had worshiped, we had, um, there was lip service anyway, going to the Lord, but there was not a point of breakthrough. And I got a question, I sensed it was from the Lord that I was to ask the group. And I ran it by my husband, he said, oh, wait on that one. And then it still didn't move for like another 20 minutes. And, and he agreed, go ahead and ask this question. Now realize when a prayer summit takes place, we were gathering with the ministry leaders, the pastors, um, superintendents of denominations. We were meeting with all of those together for these four days to seek the Lord from different denominations. The question that the Lord gave me to ask in, in that setting was, is there anyone here that doesn't believe God loves them? Now you can see why my husband didn't want me to ask that question, because <laughs> why would you ask that of a group of pastors? Is there anyone here that doesn't believe God loves them? And when I asked the question, one person got up, got into the middle of the room, laid down, curled into a ball and began to weep. And I heard the Lord say, there's more. And I said, there's more. Seven more laid down in the middle of, of the circle and began to weep. And then the Lord said, there's more. We had 15 who came and got into the middle of the circle who had been in ministry their whole lives, but had not believed the love God has for them. That kind of restoration of life to the Father came at this point. It became the point of breakthrough. So we had worship. There was a question that made a whole group respond, and it brought the whole group into unity with the Father. So once there's uni unity with the Father, it leads to a level of true community. I had the privilege of facilitating a prayer summit in Israel. And when we facilitated this first women's prayer summit in Israel, we had probably 50 women there. They were from all different mission backgrounds. We had Arab um, uh, Baptist believers. We had Russian Pentecostal believers. We had Ethiopian Jewish uh, Christians who had, who had just flown from Ethiopia into Israel. 
We had the whole European uh, missionary community. And when they walked into the room, you could sense about 2000 years worth of animosity. There was not unity in the room. There was not a community of believers. There were 50 isolated believers who had come into one room and we began to worship. We tried for a breakthrough to get to this point of unity and community and it didn't happen and it didn't happen. And on the last night, we had communion together. So are we really going to be in communion or not? We set out a table. We had a really big loaf of challah bread there. We had jugs of juice and we had hundreds and hundreds of cups. And we asked them instead of taking it for themselves that after we prayed, we said, would you take the bread and the cup would you go to another person? Would you pray a blessing over them and serve them? And you can do it as many times as you like. And so we began to share the bread and the cup around the room. I'll just tell you, communion took close to three hours. We were each served 40 plus times. <laughs> The, it's the only time I've ever taken communion and, and gotten full. Um, we finished when there was not a, a crumb of bread and there was not a drop of juice left. But what happened is we went from worship and honestly, humility, unity with the Father and community kind of came at one point in that particular summit because the unity with the Father brought about this unity amongst the whole group. We went through the four and made it through the four. Now, the last thing that we find as a part of this summit experience is a church that can meet with Jesus four days and get through those four things will go back and have great impact. Now, here's where we usually start out at, you know, as we're putting together ministry ideas, we can gather at our churches and try to start at the point of impact, but you can't have impact in a community without being in, without, you can't have impact without community, and you can't have community without unity with the Father. You can't have unity with the Father without humility, and that can only happen in this place of prayer and ministry to the Lord. So this is called the hand illustration. And it keeps us reminded that when we want to see impact, when we want to see the flow of ministry going out, it has to start here in the, in the presence of God, listening, focusing on ministering to him, listening, coming into a place of humility, which brings us into unity with the Father, community with the saints, and then that releases a level of impact in the world. What begins to happen then is we begin to see what Jesus prayed for in John 17. I love the whole prayer, and we're used to Jesus's, um, the Lord's Prayer, Part of it is that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And one time as I, I was reading through, that's the word that caught me with that prayer is the word as. How does his will get done on earth? It gets done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, in heaven, God's will gets done because he is a community, Father, Son, and Spirit. And we have got to learn how to operate at that level of community as well. And so Jesus's high priestly prayer, I'm going to skip to verses 22 and 23 of John 17. And it says, and the glory which thou hast given me, I've given to them that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and thou in me that they may be perfected in unity, that the world may know 
that thou didst send me and didst love them even as thou didst love me. Jesus prayed an interesting thing that we would be perfected in unity. And because we haven't seen all that much unity, we think, well, eventually we'll be perfected. That word perfected though has a couple other meanings. It means made complete or made mature. So Jesus prays that we will be made mature in unity. It, it, it doesn't mean, <laughs> we often look at the goal of the sentence it is unity, but unity is the means for being made mature. When he prays that we would be perfected in unity, how about he prays that we would be made mature in unity? It takes it from uh, unity being the object of the sentence to it being the means and uh, unity brings about maturity instead. Just for an example, on the day that a couple gets married and God unites them, it is preserving that unity that allows the marriage to mature. It's not that they someday will attain unity. It is as they maintain unity, maturity takes place. That's also true in the body of Christ. We've looked at it, someday we might get united. We might have unity. And if there's ever anything that we need in the body of Christ right now, it's unity. We can't look at it as someday we'll be perfected in unity. We have got to look at it as, as we maintain the unity of the body, then we will mature. We can stay immature. <laughs> And we can, we can be um, prone to believing things that divide us. But his prayer is that we would be perfected or made mature in unity. There's a couple obstacles that work against this. There's a couple deceptions that come into play that tend, I call them ancient deceptions. They come into play and they've been here all along and we fall for them frequently. And they are found in um, 1 Corinthians 12, 15 and 1 Corinthians 12, 21. When you look at those um, two places, one of them is a self-eliminating rejection. 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 15 says, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. So there's deceptions come in that tend to, we eliminate ourselves. I don't belong here. I'm not a part. Or 1 Corinthians 12, 21 says, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. We have other eliminating deceptions. Right now, God has made his body to need one another, to be perfected, we will mature in unity, and we have got to learn what this looks like in order to bear his resemblance on the earth. He has a plan for us. Now, the other, um, the other uh, scriptures that I want uh, us to take note of, and I, I'm going to look at them fairly quickly, and then I have some questions to run by you. It's, you can also post questions to me, but I have some questions to run by you as part of this. Um, do you have a conviction in your heart concerning the corporate nature of the body. Um, John 1, 16, John 1, 16 says, for of his fullness, we have all received and grace upon grace. 
there are four places where it describes the fullness of Christ. Three of them are found in Ephesians. One of them is found in John 1.16. I'm supposed to be filled with the Spirit and continually filled with the Spirit. But there's a difference between me being filled and us experiencing the fullness of Christ. I, no matter how full of the spirit I am, I am not the fullness of deity in bodily form. But he says that his fullness will dwell with his people when there's two or three gathered in his name. And Ephesians goes on to describe the kinds of things that we will experience when his fullness is among us. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 says, and he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. He wants to fill all, but he will be found when it's in all. So it's more than just me or more than just you. Ephesians 3.17, this is one of his re Paul's really long verses, so I'm kind of starting in the middle of a verse, but I'm going to read it from verse 17 through 20. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Those who struggle with knowing and believing that God loves them, they need to begin to experience it with all the saints, to know that there is a people that they belong to. And then the last one is uh, Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, where it talks about he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith, the knowledge of the son of God to a mature man to, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. This is a, a picture of uh, what happens when he gets to operate in our midst. So prayer summits have been a place where I've been able to experience this kind of corporateness, this kind of aliveness, this kind of opportunity to see a church where Jesus pulls us together and we can operate from the level of the heart. But during these times, I haven't been able to facilitate a summit for months now in person. I was able to help do it online um, this last week. Um, uh, we facilitated one where we we did it via zoom and rather than three days we went three hours so but for the last little while we haven't been able to gather in these large gatherings but i found something out churches haven't been able to gather uh city groups haven't been able to gather but there's an ability to gather as a church of the heart um able to meet in those smaller uh, units as a church of the heart and experience meeting with Jesus in this same way that we met at a, um, a macro level, it can take place at a micro level as well. So two or three that gather together, listening and praying together can experience the same kind of church life and there becomes a knitting together in ways that really it's almost like taking the body of Christ and going down to the level of the cell and making sure that at the cell level every part is there and every part is functioning. 
we begin to see links made where if if there are healthy units of uh, three to five people, and then another healthy unit of three to five people, you begin to see almost a web of life develop in a congregation. And those congregations are sustained. I think the congregations that are having the hardest time right now is, are the ones that are uh, doing, you know, uh, uh, the sermon online worship online, but the people are having little or no contact with one another. This is this opportunity for us to gather and for us to not just go to church, but to begin to be the church and experience these five qualities down at the, at the micro level. So I'm gonna ask some questions. Um, uh, the first Corinthians reference that I gave was first Corinthians 12, 15, um, and verse 21. So I'm going to ask some questions, um, and I'm going to, um, these are just for you to think about. These are for you to consider because you may, you may listen to me talk about facilitating prayer summits and think, ah, I'll never be in that situation. You may not see yourself as a church planter, but maybe after today you do, two or three gathered in his name can begin to have a significant effect if Jesus is a part of you. Because where, where two or three are gathered, he's in the midst and he can operate through you as he begins to operate among you and show himself that way. So here's some questions to ask yourself. Is there a group or a team that you're a part of that's formed on the basis of the same heart rather than the same task? Have you kind of uncovered over the last months who it is that your heart needs to be together with. You know, you may have been on different teams of ministry in the past, but are there heart connections that you are realizing that have been forming now during the time of quarantine, during the time where we've mostly been at home? Who are the heart connections that you've made, um, that you've bonded with? And if you begin to pay attention to those heart connections, I bet you you'll find there are heart connections at the level of your family that are different. Some of your connections may be with people in other cities. It could be with people in other denominations. But as you begin to look at where your heart connections are, you realize this is the church that's been carrying me through this time. Okay. Anybody experiencing that, that there is a level of a church of the heart that you've experienced during these days, that these are the people you can't live without? May only be one other person, but one other person with Jesus is, uh, that's, that's a good size group. <laughs> um, so that's the first question. Do you have a group like that? And then here's another question. What group or team of people most allows you to function fully in your gifts and or personality? Who do you feel at home with? What group or team of people most allows you to function fully in your gifts? Or, and or you as a person, you don't feel like you have to keep yourself contained. First Corinthians 14, 26 talks about when we come together, one has a psalm, one has a hymn, one has a scripture. Those places where we tend to um, begin to feel like we belong, are those places where we get to participate. 
I think participation is critical in this hour and it's critical for forming a church of the heart. I do something called a sonship study. It's really discipleship that's not aimed at the head as much as it is at the heart. And when I started it, um, I've, I've done them ever since 2008. I've started them, um, a lot of them in Portland. But once I realized, hey, we can do this online and now we can have people from five states on the, as a part of the same sonship study. What began to happen because they all participate. So within a few weeks, this kind of participating where Jesus gets to lead our time, they bonded in just two to three weeks to such a degree that they wanted to fly together as soon as, as the pandemic's over to meet one another. That says quite a bit. Um, the third question, what is it about the group that contributes to this sense of belonging? Now, is it when we are in a group that's linking our hearts together, it's usually a place where we feel received, where we feel received. And we get to give that to one another. Jesus came and he realized he wasn't received. We can give that away as a gift. You're received here. Next question. Who are five people in your life that orient you more towards Christ than toward a task? Who are five people in your life that orient you more towards, more towards Christ than a task? Now, my prayer is that, that you would have that. You would at least have five that there could be some sense of mutuality with when it comes to your walk with Jesus. But when you have these groups that orient you towards Christ, that they're as interested in Christ as you are in Christ, and you stimulate one another to love and good deeds, any of us can do that. You, can, you don't have to wait and um, hope your church does it this way. We can begin to be church planters in a... If you, if you plant a church of the heart, you bring people together at the level of the heart to meet with Jesus. And this can be something you do on your lunch hour at work. It can be something you do if you're overseas where you can't build a building. This begins to be the way that we can link our hearts together and live Jesus' life among us. My next question. Does this group know how to operate with Jesus's presence as the head of the church? Remember when I said that, that group of pastors from Salem went away for four days? Most of the people who had gone away, they were used to being the leaders in their congregation. But for those four days, they weren't the leader. And guess what? The facilitator wasn't the leader either. Everybody was listening hard for where is the Lord and what does he want to do among us? And so learning how to operate with the invisible presence of the living God, sometimes it's almost easier to begin to learn that in a small group, two or three, than it is to accomplish it in a big group. So I challenge you, uh, step into this. When you gather with other believers, meet with Jesus as well during that time. That, that becomes the place where a new church can be planted, a new church of the heart. So it, you may have a, a, a congregation that you're a part of. That doesn't mean you can't be planting churches of the heart with all different groups of folks that you meet with. A number of years ago, and I'm probably dating myself now, although when I look at a lot of <laughs> a lot of the others on the screen, you're, you're kind of in the same category with me, but there was a book that came out that everybody was using called Experiencing God. 
It was a kind of a devotional that, uh, and a workbook that people work through. And it had a huge impact because it began to take people through, here is how we experience the Lord together. The one thing uh, that came as a result of this book though, was where are people putting this into practice? And the questions were, where can this happen? Because they weren't finding a lot of churches that changed their church life in order to adopt what was uh, recommended in experiencing God. But guess what? Wherever you gather together with one or two other people, you can begin to experience this kind of life together. Um, one of the questions that just came was, are the churches of the heart for specific prayer groups or to do life together? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I think when you begin to be drawn together in prayer, and I think prayer groups are a great place. In fact, I think you're already experiencing it in a prayer group oftentimes, if, especially if you're listening. Uh, as part of your praying. And it's not just making a list for God, but listening to him and taking your instruction from him. There's so much more that flows out from a people that become knit together in this way. So you begin to have a meal together. You're sharing the word together. Um, there's four qualities that show up in Acts chapter two, verse four. These are four practices that the early church just automatically began to do. Nobody said, if you're going to be the church, you have to include these four practices. These began to automatically flow when the Holy Spirit was in their midst. They listened to the apostles' teaching. They had fellowship. They broke bread together, and they prayed those were the four things that became the dynamic expression of the church as it gathered. And as they did those things, um, they experienced Jesus in their midst by the Holy Spirit, and the church was added to daily. You know, the watching culture saw the way they loved one another. One of the things Dr. Joe started out the prayer summits with was the question, what would it take to see a move of God initiated and sustained in a given region? We initiated prayer summits. They've, they've taken place all over the earth, but a move of God sustained requires it not just being at the leadership level that people go away once a year and experience him, but that it comes down so that every part of the body is experiencing that same kind of dynamic life. So churches of the heart experiencing those same, the same pattern that I shared earlier and doing it with the same pattern that the early church experienced with the apostles teaching, fellowship, breaking bread and prayer. That's what it's gonna to take to see a move of God initiated and sustained, not just at the macro, but the micro level. So look, look at that list of, in Acts chapter two, take a look at the list that's there and it is the gathering that you're a part of healthy in these things? Do they include all of these uh, potential ways of meeting with Jesus? Is there a part of it that's neglected? One of the things that is really important is sharing the same table together, being able to sit down and eat with one another. That's, that's critical for us beginning to consider ourselves a family. You can't be a part of the church and be anonymous. And it's when we sit down face to face over a meal, we begin to experience that family life. That's probably the thing I miss the most, even at the level of churches of the heart, small groups, 
we have a lot of small groups that uh, my husband and I oversee. And it, it's got to get pretty small for us to be able to take any kind of a meal <laughs> together. And as cold as it is, it is right now, it's a little bit cold to be eating outside. But we, tr we still, that's an important component and we're longing for that. One of the things over the past 10 months is people couldn't go to church, but were they prepared to be the church? And so in this next season of time, my challenge really is to all of us is, where is God calling us to be the church? And then to begin to experience him in our midst and watch and see how he would multiply what we have amongst ourselves the kind of fruit that could come from that. And if anybody's willing to put these things into practice, even in your family or your marriage or your, your group of close friends. So um, that's what I wanted to share with you today. I'm, um, I've walked in this kind of meeting with Jesus for close to 30 years. I have watched him build his church with both of these patterns and I've experienced it at the, at the smallest level and at the, at the city level as well. So um, I wanna open it up for any questions. If you wanna uh, type a question in here, um, anybody have anything that they wanna to run by me and ask? I think we're a small enough group we could um, even unmute. If you want to go ahead and, ahead and unmute, I'll go ahead and take the questions. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, you mentioned listening to the elders preaching as part of that sequence of events. Uh -huh. uh, we've had two opportunities to visit my wife's brother-in-law and his wife in Bend, Oregon even during this virus. And um, we usually end with prayer, but we have a dinner and, and there's not the teaching part, although we may share things that the Lord is teaching us, but mm -hmm. would that qualify in your mind of listening to the teaching or not? Yeah, I, I think the overall, an overall healthy church, they're listening to the apostles teaching. And so, Honestly, the apostles teaching is our scripture. And whenever we have pastors can share that, or when we gather around the word and share it, we're kind of giving ourselves to the apostles teaching. So the kind of church of the heart, when, when you get into a small group and it's like three to five people, you don't usually have one person who's preaching in that size of a group. But if you have one person shares from the scripture, another person responds to it, you take it back to prayer. Yeah, you, you begin to have that kind of a, a dynamic life in the smallest possible group. So. Anybody else have a question? Yeah, do, you, do you still do your, um, the sonship um, online? I do have, do you have enough, you... yeah, I do have sonship studies are on, all of them are online right now, but I'm starting to okay. see that the blessing of, of these, um, of the COVID and not being able to gather is now there are people from across the country able to gather and participate in it. So, so yeah, is it still open them. for people to come? Um, Say that again, please. Sir. Um, my email address is up here in the chat okay. area. And so if you want to chat I'm with me about on. where they are available, I could talk with you. Okay, uh, let me get a pen, please. <laughs> yeah, I would love to have your email. And, uh... Yeah, that, it, that's up there. One thing about the Sonship study mm -hmm. is we have, um, what, we have, what we have. Sorry, I'm not. I'm not good at internet. 
I'm not good at the computer, so I'm trying to find your email. Okay, it's Jody, J-O-D-Y, at prayersummits.net. You are. Jody at summits.net. At prayersummit.net. Net. Okay. And summits with an S. I see it. You have it on there. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what we found with doing um, the sonship groups is we, we kind of model them on the same thing, same way. We allow everybody to participate. People are bringing how the Lord convicted their hearts. Uh, we kind of go through this same process as we gather in these sonship groups, and the learning has been pretty incredible. Um, when I taught this down in Medellin, Colombia, they started friendship studies amongst all unbelievers. They all came to Christ. But part of it was the ability to participate and to respond to Jesus from the heart, not just the head, but from the heart. And he met them there. And I mean, it grew quickly. So any other questions? We have at our church, we have life groups is what it's called. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we have a uh, study around the word and we have uh, prayer time. And um, sometimes we have um, uh, like a potluck or we used to. Um, and uh, then there's, uh, you know, we share each other's phone number. A lot of the people have been going to the same group for years. And there's just a, a in-depth feeling of love and acceptance there. And it's just um, incredible uh, the difference um, overall um, yeah. well-being. Yeah, uh, they're called life groups. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because that's where you experience life. Have they continued to meet during the pandemic? Um, that one hasn't because it's a... a a group of older women, and a lot of them have not even um, got technology at all. Yeah. So, but um, continued to uh, call. Um, we usually have three or four people that we, you know, kind of get close to and we continue to call with them and, and yeah. um, visit. So um, you just feel part of, of that group, even though you're not part of that group. Yeah, you can, you can see that that's where the life and the, can, the sustaining of life in the body is right now and can be even more dynamic in the days ahead. Some of us have been limited to just who was in like your, um, your neighborhood. And there have been new webs of church developing across neighborhoods as we meet together with, you know, someone from this congregation and this congregation. Now we're meeting and joining in prayer together. And God's been forming some new, some new ways of being the church together. Okay, any other questions or we'll bring this time to a close. Um, do you still like when it opens up do like prayer summits or, you know, thinking of in the future of our church, you know, I wanted to suggest that to our prayer, le our ministry leaders or um, it, will that be, does that still happen or who, how do you facilitate that? or I mean, or have you come or, yeah. Yeah, prayer summits are still happening. Um, you can get in touch with me at that uh, email address. 
Okay. And uh, we can talk more about it. But, okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, probably not until um, public gatherings can take place again. Right. <laughs> so our, yeah. our women's prayer summit for the Northwest was canceled by Cannon Beach this year, about three days before it started. So all the people that had flown in had to oh. return home. So, oh, okay. Thank you. Um, just, um, yeah. I, any other questions? All right, thank you for joining with us and I hope you're blessed for the rest of the day and the, the rest of uh, Mission Connection. Thank you, we appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so thank much. Thank you.